Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this presentation by the Katona Museum of Art. Christopher Rothko speaking on Mark Rothko and the quiet dominance of form. I am Michael Gitlitz and have the pleasure of serving as executive director of the Katona Museum of Art. Thanks to Michelle Rukowski and to Emily Hanlon for organizing this evening's program. Before I welcome and introduce tonight's guest lecturer, Christopher Rothko, a brief background. Christopher and I were introduced to each other by Mark and Rochelle Rosenberg and have been talking over the last two years about the idea of showing his father's work at the KMA. I had heard that Mark Rothko had envisioned small one-work chapels along the sides of highways, unfortunately never realized, where travelers could stop to spiritually recharge, an idea that Christopher later confirmed was true. One of the KMA's strengths is the ability to create powerful yet intimate exhibitions. And so I conceived of the idea of building a small room within one of the KMA galleries, a sanctum sanctorum, where visitors to the KMA could sit and contemplate a single masterpiece and have an immersive and hopefully spiritually recharging experience, just as Rothko had originally envisioned. We were able to introduce the Rothko Room this fall through the generosity of Christopher Rothko, as well as Mark and Rochelle Rosenberg with the installation of a 1951 work. And then this March through the generosity of Audrey and Richard Zinman with the installation of a 1969 work, as well as an early still life currently on view through June 27th. I am deeply grateful to Christopher as well as to the Rosenbergs and the Zinmans for allowing the creation of the Rothko Room at the KMA. We're very fortunate to have Christopher Rothko with us this evening to offer this lecture. Christopher is so many things. He's a writer and psychologist. He's the second child of Mark and Mary Alice Rothko. Christopher chairs the board of directors of the Rothko Chapel Houston and is actively involved in managing the Rothko legacy by helping to organize more than two dozen Rothko exhibitions at museums and galleries around the globe. He's also lectured on his father's work at institutions such as the National Gallery of Art, Washington, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the Getty Museum, Los Angeles, the Hermitage Museum, the Foundation Beiler, Basel, and the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, and now the Katona Museum of Art. Christopher is also the editor of his father's book of philosophical writings, The Artist's Reality, Philosophies of Art, published in 2004. His book of essays, Mark Rothko from the Inside Out, was published in 2015 by Yale University Press. More recently, Christopher wrote an introduction to the newly published book, Rothko Chapel, an Oasis for Reflection, and will return to the Katona Museum of Art in June to discuss this book along with other contributing authors. I am delighted to welcome Christopher to this evening's event hosted by the Katona Museum of Art, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you. Thank you, Michael. It's a thrill to be at the Katona Museum of Art, live streaming from the Rothko Room. This is the closest thing I've done to real life in person in more than a year. Uh, I, I hope it's a portent of, uh, of better things to come. Uh, in any case, I'm thrilled to, uh, to spend this uh, bit of time with you this afternoon, talk a little bit about Rothko, and uh, hopefully make uh, some connections with art. Again, I think we're all hungry for that direct connection. And in fact, you can get that at museums like the Katona Museum of Art. Um, and you, it's, it's open and uh, you can uh, get a ticket and come here. And I highly encourage you to do it. The, uh, the Still Lives uh, still live, uh, exhibition right now is, is fabulous. I just toured through it. So really encourage you to come. So um, this afternoon, I will be talking to you about Mark Rothko and the quiet dominance of form. Uh, this is actually one of the favorite topics of mine to talk about. Um, and I uh, welcome your comments and uh, frankly disagreements uh, at, at the end. Color. Always the first word one associates with Rothko paintings. Bright resplendent color, dark, somber color, audacious reds, luminous yellows, haunting blues, earthy browns and wines, mysterious blacks and charcoals. These colors attract us, even seduce us. 
with the sensuality that Rothko asserted was the essential mode of communication for the visual arts. They mesmerize our eyes, trigger our emotions, stimulate untouched nerves, and wrap us in a holistic, full mind body experience. That experience is so powerful in part because there's so little to interfere with colors in passion play upon the below upon and below the surface. Indeed, color so dominates the canvas amidst rectangular fields so simple. It's as if Rothko had cleared all else from the stage to allow color to perform its own virtuosic dance. And yet, from my own lifelong involvement with my father's work, I find that it's not color with all its brilliance, but the form with its comparative blandness which directs the action. Color may be the dancer, engaging the viewer with his undeniable energy, but it is kept on deceptively tight grain by the forms that define its arena and shape its movement. That dancer may be the one to shine, but her performance is crafted under the careful guidance of the choreographer or director who helps elevate skill and beauty to the level of art. Our instincts fight against this. It's hard to get excited about the lowly rectangle. It is truly the most pedestrian of shapes. Even the circle or the triangle would have been more engaging. And the square, meanwhile, courtesy Malevich, has gained an air of mystery and command that is unlikely to be equal. Rothko embraced the rectangle all the same, and we can bet that this most deliberate and calculating of painters did not come by this shape casually. Instead, he chose the rectangle because it provided precisely the formal attributes he needed to express his ideas most fully, most clearly, and yes, most passionately. Let us take a more in-depth look and examine how this might be. Rothko's classic work is so synonymous with color that some have suggested that the paintings are in fact about color, that the medium is indeed the message. These assertions have ranged from the dismissal of Rothko painting that was merely decorative to modernist or minimalist notions of color studies as sufficient in and of themselves, to more psychological, mystical discussions of the symbolic meanings of Rothko's specific colors. My father stated repeatedly, however, that he was, quote, not interested in color, unquote. And while I certainly would not recommend doing so in all instances, I think in this case, you should take my father at his word. It is not simply that he repeatedly asserted the philosophical and humanistic underpinnings of his work, or that viewers and critics alike find profundity in what he produced. No, to see Rothko paintings as primarily concerned with color fundamentally misapprehends the world of meaning in which they function, and just essentially misapprehends how that meaning is achieved. Color for Rothko is a means to an end, not an end in itself. It is a medium through which he can express his ideas about the world. Color is not the object of those, of those ideas, and in fact, Rothko is quite wary of giving color free reign. Now, before I turn to the painted evidence of this stance, I will share some notes from his writings that discuss his ideas about color. So, for example, and we can move to the first uh, slide of text. For example, in examining Cezanne's move away from impressionist technique, he sounds a note of caution concerning color. Cezanne saw clearly that with the pursuit of Monet's preoccupations, all visual phenomena would be distinguished in, I'm sorry, would be disintegrated into a series of equally material color blobs that would be the dissolution of all reality. But the result would be an ultimate monotony, wherein the similar would annihilate all differences, a situation which is not consistent with our conscious awareness. Cezanne de Rothko's mind pulls away from Impressionism because that movement deals only in color and therefore lies outside reality as we perceive it. By extension, it would appear that for Rothko, it is through form and shape that we may make sense of the reality of things. What is just as crucial as the formal questions he raises here is Rothko's reference to an experientially based reality. For Rothko, the human and human experience is always the benchmark from which we must measure. Painting that has no relation to the human, which does not express itself in ideas central to human consciousness, is ultimately irrelevant, perhaps even decadent. To 
Rothko's mind, Cezanne is the greater painter than Monet because he recognizes and embraces this human reference. And he goes on to produce paintings of real weight and substance rather than studies in visual effects and perceptual phenomena. It is therefore essential as we examine many of the compositional factors in Rothko's paintings that we always keep in view, as my father did, this human yardstick as a measure of the relevance of what we discover. Now, while it was not commonplace for my father actually to disavow the importance of color, it is remarkable how frequently, at least in his early writings, he assigned it to a subservient role and certainly did not place it in the pantheon of the artist's tools that one would naturally expect from a consideration of his paintings. We can go to the next slide. Witness here Rothko's assertion of the dominant position of form in his treatise, The Artist's Reality. The fundamental unity of conception lies in the kind of space the artist employs, and the kind of space he uses will determine how color, line, texture, chiaroscuro, and every other item contributes to this movement. For all these elements intrinsically have the potential to produce motion. Color advances and recedes. Line gives the direction, the attitude, and the tilt of shapes. The functions of each of these elements in the plastic scheme are unique, additive, and essential. But before these can be dealt with, we must discuss the world of space, where it determines how the others will function in the picture. Now, with other artists, I'd be very cautious to equate the words space and form. In the case of my father's classic work, at least, however, the very openness and spaciousness of his chosen form seems to bring the two together. Thus, when he champions space, he is speaking, I believe, of that dancer's stage, which I described earlier. And he's intently aware that that stage is critical place in allowing the dancer's performance to come fully to fruition. In the following chapter of The Artist's Reality, however, my father goes yet one step further, where he takes the role of space and form to that all-important level of meaning. We must remember that this is an artist who said there is, quote, no such thing as good painting about nothing, unquote. So we know with confidence the critical place meaning holds for Rothko. And in this passage, he is unequivocal about the source of meaning in painted artwork. The next slide, slide please. If one understands, or if one has a sensibility to live in, the particular kind of space to which a painting is committed, then he has obtained the most comprehensive statement of an artist's attitude toward reality. Space, therefore, is the chief plastic manifestation of the artist's conception of reality. It is the most inclusive category of the artist's statement and can very well be called the, meaning, the key to the meaning of the picture. It constitutes a statement of faith, an a priori unity, to which all the plastic elements are in a state of subservience. So I think we've established by this point the essential place that form holds Rothko in his conception of how paintings work. We can also understand that at least during the 1930s and 1940s, color was clearly the secondary force to him, both in building the composition and in defining or expressing its meaning. And despite the scope and detail with which my father expressed his philosophical views on art, the fact remains he was an artist, not a writer or a philosopher. Ultimately, the proof of the painting is in the viewing, and we must come to our own understanding of how his compositions achieve their effects. If I can have the first painting slide, please. This is actually the first painting shown in the Rothko room here in Katona. So let us return to the rectangle, that shape he explored so doggedly for two decades, two decades time, to see if we can find the source of its appeal and power for this artist. Clearly for my father, the rectangle offered tremendous flexibility, seeming to get out of the way and allowing him to say whatever he had to say within its bounds, without drawing attention to itself. It's not an exciting shape, but therein lies its self-effacing beauty. It is almost an unshape. And what we may ask is the shape of that unshape. What is it that makes the rectangle so generic? The rectangle is quite simply what we see every time we open our eyes. 
regardless of what we are looking at. It is so omnipresent that we are rarely aware that it is there. But whether we are conscious of, the, conscious of it or not, the rectangle presides as roughly the shape of our field of vision, the box of the lens through which we view the world. And, I, and thus, I think we can understand that Rothko chose the rectangle precisely because it defines space in the most natural and absolute way. It mimics our field of vision and creates a nearly organic picture frame, or heaven, heaven forbid, television screen in which we can view the other elements of the painting. As we consider Rothko's choice, we may note that it is hardly an accident that movie screens, theater stages, and indeed most paintings themselves share this shape. The rectangle, although hardly inspiring in and of itself, provides the most natural frame for the activity that occur occurs within it. Although on one level the rectangle remains unobtrusive, we should not therefore assume that it exerts no influence over what we see. Stage directors will adjust curtains and scrims endlessly in order to present exactly the view into the stage that will maximize the impact of what occurs upon it. Similarly, in the world of film or photography, the framing of the scene or picture is not only critical to the aesthetic experience of what is presented, but also provides a central means for the author to present his or her point of view. Can I have the next slide, please? This is the famous photograph of Rosa Parks on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, an icon of the civil rights movement. And it would have been an entirely different photograph if it had been cropped to show just her, rather than also including the apparently disgruntled man in hazy focus to her rear. I will show you just what that looks like. I've done a little uh, slightly illegal cropping, but I wanted to show you just how different a composition this is, how differently we read what's going on, and how potentially different the meaning is of this photograph as opposed to what the photographer has presented us. The artist, the filmmaker, the director, the photographer, they all frame the scene to show, to show us what they want us to see. This is how they tell their story. And we must assume that Rothko, an artist who called his paintings dramas, and who made multiple references to the theater in his writings, was keenly aware of just these issues. The next slide, please. Having, having settled upon the rectangle, how then did Rothko utilize it to shape the world of his paintings? By exploring that silent, omnipresent frame of our visual perception, he builds our fields of vision to this effect largely independent of size, although my father was certainly not hesitant about making large paintings. By filling our field of vision, Rothko pulls us into the painting as a world of its own, inviting or nearly demanding direct and intense interaction between viewer and picture. He creates a work that is its own small universe, a place that encompasses a potent reduction of our human experience. Very natural on the surface, but quite a manipulative coup underneath, I believe. As a result of having our universe framed in this manner, small variations in the rectangles can greatly influence our sensory experience of space in Rothko paintings. There are those paintings which seem ever expanding and those which remain static, those which invite you in and those which close you out. The way in which he paints the rectangles shapes the experiential world of the painting, its confines and its accessibility. It shapes our interaction with the painting. These effects and the play of color within these conditions are all minutely controlled by the rectangles and the fields in which they float. The hardness or wispiness of the rectangle's edges, the extent of the border area, the juxtaposition of the rectangles on the plane, the amount of brushwork in each, in each of the fields, all, all of these factors assert their influence. And keep some of those elements in mind because we're now going to look at a, a number of examples and see how they play out differently in each of these paintings. Let's go to the next slide. And these two canvases are both from 1956. Both feature brilliant reds and glowing yellows, and yet the effect of each painting, the feeling emanating from each one, could hardly be more contrasted. The difference in their formal properties and the way these define, the way these define their space. In yellow over purple on the left, 
the rectangles hover in space in front of the background. Their softly painted edges and translucent centers reveal, at least to my eye, a sense of vulnerability. They are in flux, and while in reproduction it's not entirely clear whether they are expanding or contracting, they are certainly still in a state of becoming. That is hardly the case with that title 1956 on the right, although it is essentially the same color scheme, it speaks to an entirely different sensibility. Here, the yellow rectangle defiantly proclaims itself against the red background, nearly taking over the entire top two thirds of the painting. Unlike yellow or purple, however, this rectangle is static, solid, and this, in the sense we have of its bursting its bounds come from the fact that it has nearly eclipsed its border, rather than the form of the rectangle itself. Similarly, while in the first painting, the two rectangles seem to engage in a type of dialogue, in the untitled work, the yellow rectangle appears completely in a world unto itself, opaque and letting nothing in, hardly letting us take notice of the red rectangle beneath, which nearly disappears in the light colored background. These, of course, are my own personal associations to the works, but it's hard to deny the dissimilarity of feeling in these two paintings, whose colors are so much alike, but whose forms reveal substantial differences. It's easy to find a much closer kin for yellow over purple. We can look see this in the next slide. In paintings with very different color schemes. For example, the number seven, 1963, maybe, maybe my all time favorite Rothko, certainly very close to the top. And in this painting, we can see the formal similarities to yellow over purple are, are really quite obvious. One can also find kindred paintings, however, where the arrangements and proportions of the rectangles are quite different from yellow over purple along with the colors, which would share the translucency, feathered edges, of some of it, and some of its relation to space within the painting. An example of this, as we can see in the next slide, is green on blue, also from 1956. Although there are many differences between them, this painting shares a great deal with yellow over purple, more than it does untitled 1956, the big yellow and red painting despite the near color match between those two bright yellow paintings that I discussed above. Form, as we can see in these examples, really does direct the role color plays and ultimately the message the painting conveys. We can learn more about Rothko's use of form by examining two paintings from presumably the same moment of 1957. You can see these in the next slide. We have number 14, 1957 on the left, and number 15, 1957 on the right, right, excuse me. Both painted in meditative green tones upon vibrant, one more time, vibrant blue fields. The primary difference between the two works does not seem to emanate from the presence of white in number 14, a color that is absent from number 15. Instead, the formal differences dominate. First, the broad landscape orientation of number 15, which entirely fills the horizon, in contrast with number 14, which almost seems to support a figure made from its three rectangles. Although both are quite large paintings, number 15 seems to be expanding ever outward, in almost languid, inevitable way. <clears throat> number 14 is much more tightly contained within its broad borders. Its energy is far more nervous, and one can feel the rectangles pushing to break free. Although the borders are broad in number 15 as well, they are not as broad, and they cannot compete with the sheer mass of the rectangles. The feeling of energy in number 14 on the left also stems from the area around each rectangle, where there's a lighter, mistier shade, an area where two substances or forces are interacting and matter is unsettled, much like the corona of a star where the fiery gases meet the near vacuum of space. And finally, the greater tension in number 14 seems to stem more from the active way the rectangles are painted, with significantly more brushwork and interplay, with underlayers much more visible than in number 15 on the right. Again, it is primarily the formal differences between these works, the details and the ways in which they are painted, that account for the distinct effects upon us. Rothko does not need different color to say things differently. Next slide, please. Now, we know that formal balances were essential to my father because there are many works where we can see that he has expanded or contracted the rectangles from their initial size. 
seeking the perfect rating of the forms. And this painting, number nine from 1958, is one of the glories of Rothko's oeuvre. But the examination of its center rectangle clearly reveals that it was reworked by Rothko, that the red form was opened up to balance the weight of those above and below it. And to highlight that role of rebalancing, we can move to the next slide. I have made a digitally manipulated rendering of the work. I'm allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> Don't do that at home, please. And you can see that I, in this lower version, um, I've removed those red pieces that he added to each side, revealing just. And I and I think when you remove that extra, that extra sense of space, that extra sense of mass, it, it reveals just how essential those additions are to the painting's function. And we can also note how pro problems of color may be outweighed by felicities of form. And the most stri striking example of this is my father's ill-fated murals from his Harvard commission, which faded over a 20-year period from uh, uh, a 20-year period in glaring sunlight from burgundy and pink and ultimately to cobalt blue. We can see those in the next slide. This is something of pretty close to the original color on the left and on the right what that faded to uh, 20 years uh, sitting, uh, or 20 years on the wall directly across from a floor ceiling window. And yet so compelling and intriguing is the form of these mural paintings that even though the color has completely changed, they remain hauntingly beautiful and hardly less engaging. And I, I have to I, I have to say I, I'm I am not sure the painting if the painting has changed. I'm not sure that it's any less strong than it was in its original color form. The years from 1957 into 1962 were in fact absolutely critical ones for the development of Rothko's work and very revealing of the central role form plays in the composition of his paintings. These years encompass the first two mural compositions, the first for the Seagram Building in New York and the second for Holyoke Center at Harvard, which these murals are examples of each of which prompted new explorations of form to address the problems and possibilities raised by these large-scale projects. Now, 1957 is also the year that my father marked as the year his dark paintings began. Now, in fact, that assertion is rather misleading. There are wonderfully rich dark paintings from the early 1950s, as well as brilliant ones after 1957. But it is true that there is a general darkening of the palette in the last 13 years of Rothko's career. But these changes in form during this period are at least equally responsible, responsible for the more meditative mood of those later works. Starting with the Seagram murals and continuing through the decade to the com completion of the Houston Chapel Commission, there is an increasingly, hard, increasingly increasing hardening of the edges of the rectangles. They no longer open outward and instead become more tightly defined. Space has been reined in, and much as we saw in number 14, 1957, the generally wider borders seem less malleable and open to expansion. To the next slide. Yes, many of these paintings are darker, but the overall impression is primarily tactile. I'm sorry, tactile. They feel harder, less yielding, or penetrable. For example, this painting, number five from 1963, the endless vistas opened up in the early 1950s works, have not necessarily contracted, but our access to them is more limited. During this period, my father altered the feeling and effect of his work by shifting this way space functioned in the painting. Part of this change was achieved through color, which he maintained had its own ability to create movement. But much of it was brought about through changes in the way he handled the paint. By use of dry pigment and more reflective paint, Rothko produced surfaces that are less supple and inviting. He essentially stained his canvases with turpentine thin washes of color, often just one or two colors on the background, or shortening the sense of space that had been created by the many layers of color in the early 1950s works. By simplifying the form of his rectangles, typically now much more regular in shape than those of the early 1950s. His compositions became tighter, their communication more focused and direct. Rothko also began to shift the orientation of many of his paintings starting around 1957, producing a significant change in the space they created. 
He increasingly expanded the width of his paintings as if to banish all semblance of the portrait and truly fill our horizons. While there is still a is still considerable variety, there are now many more horizontally oriented paintings, and even the vertical ones tend to be much squarer than in the past. Whether the intention was to make the paintings less personal, or to exert greater control over the viewer by filling the horizontal rectangle of his or her vision, the result is hardly less powerful than the darkening of the color palette. At the same time, Rothko's more opaque forms no longer invite the viewer so intimately into the process of the artwork. Their very humanness and indeed fallibility. But those underlayers under of paint, which seem to carry so much of the emotional content, no longer reveal their color so openly. We must work harder to engage with these paintings, which do not show themselves as readily, but which no longer welcome us quite so willingly. Rothko largely through form has subtly recreated the way we interact with his paintings. Now, much of the change in activity found in the canvases of this period are echoed and perhaps amplified in Rothko's works on paper. In 1959 was a year in which my father worked with particular enthusiasm and remarkable, remarkably beautiful results on paper, as we can see in this first example, the next slide. Now, many of these works break with the more typical juxtaposition of rectangles and through relatively small range and rearrangements of form, produce a different set of spatial reactions and offer a new type of interface for the viewer. And while the colors are particularly rich, it is the departures in form rather than color that distinguishes them from the canvases of this time. We can note the importance of form in Untitled 1959. Here, despite the striking color, it is the ethereal, brushy quality of the way the rectangles are painted, along with the central rectangle's striking control of space that give the work its expressive power. The next slide. It's also notable that Rothko made numerous, numerous sketches on paper of classic sectional compositions around this time. And significantly, all of these are executed in pen and ink rather than in color. In other words, they are clearly studies in form rather than in color relationships. Now I'll jump momentarily to the last two years of my father's life, which were also his most prolific and contained the greatest concentration of the works on paper. The next slide shows two, uh, two untitled works in 1969. And here one can observe um, examples of the last series of works on paper that he executed. Now they surprise us first because their bright colors are a departure from the somber tones associated with Rothko in the 1960s. But we should also note the return to the style he employed in the 1959 works on paper 10 years earlier, with the small upper and lower bands framing the large central field. And while the color here is certainly very powerful, it is the engulfing and disproportionate size of these central fields that produces much of the effect. The saturated pink, misty blue would not hold so much sway if, and would not have so much sway over us if they did not hold sway in just the same way in their own compositions. The shifts in form that date from 1957 and continue through the end of Rothko's life are critical to an understanding of how his work functions and dramatically reflect Rothko's increasing preoccupation with his painting's relation to the space they will inhabit. A preoccupation that's certainly prompted, certainly prompted by his mural commissions. Move to the next slide. Two strikingly horizontal works, untitled in 1958 on the left and number 30, 1962 on the right, seem in fact to parallel the large horizontal panels painted in the Seagram and Harvard mural series from those same two years. And although these paintings can most obviously be distinguished from one another by their strong tonal differences, their formal disparities are what separate them most fundamentally. Ultimately, it is the more clearly segregated relation of the rectangles to their background in the 1958 work on the left, which marks it as a new direction in my father's output. Since its colors, are certainly not outside Rothko's norms. It is the relationship to space that is unique, seemingly less complex than in the 1962 painting on the right. 
In the next slide, an example from my father's sequim, sequim series, uh, we can see that although these murals painted in some of my father's most typical colors, he showed some of perhaps some of the greatest departure from his classic format. And yet the rectangular bounds always remain, marking the field of play. And indeed, although factors such as color, transparency, and re reflectivity would all shift significantly with my father's development, the rectangle, no matter how manipulated, remained the constant defining characteristic of his work for the last 20 years of his life. Next slide. And this, in fact, remained true even for the Radhika Chapel Mural Commission, whose panels are formerly the most minimalistic works he ever painted, and yet still derive from the same basic shape. As we can see in this example, this is the South Wall Mural. My father worked on this commission for fully three years, first producing a series of hard edge canvases that have come to be known as the Blackboard paintings. He then rented a new studio where he could make a life-size replica of three walls of the chapel. And here he went to work, constantly experimenting and revising the dimensions and balances of each work. Look at the next slide. See a study from the Rothko family collection. And this is truly remarkable work. It's a study for the chapel murals. <clears throat> and it has a burgundy background that would be typical of many of the works in there. But on top of it is a black charcoal rectangle that he sketched in. And close examination reveals that this rectangle's dimensions were redrawn multiple times in both the horizontal and vertical planes. It's brought to search for the ideal contours of the shape. Rothko was no less focused on how the murals would relate to the space he conceived for them. To this end, the Rothko Chapel Archive holds a fascinating document in which my father details the installation heights and positions to within fractions of an inch, down to a quarter of an inch for each one of these mural panels, all of which are 15 feet tall. That level of detail, that level of uh, differenti differentiation in space it held deep meaning to him, and it's what he played with almost more than how to shape the, the paintings themselves for much of the last year of that commission. This is the West Wall triptych from the chapel. Now, the preeminent place of form in his own work was something that my father was also keenly aware of uh, as regards the chapel murals, and he made this quite clear in a, a remark uh, made to um, a German scholar at the time. When asked in 1967 if the color was the same in the two black form triptychs, Rothko replied, who can tell? It's all a study in proportion. And one can become engulfed in considering the two triptychs and wondering whether the shapes are the same. They appear similar, but are in fact not the same. One has vertically wider and horizontally narrower borders than the other. Standing in the meditative space that is the Rothko Chapel, it is easy to appreciate the preeminence of form in the creation of these panels. They are plainly not about color. But we must not assume that simply because these works are dark, and in some cases nearly monochromatic, that they are the exception. Just because many of the 1950s paintings are bursting with eye-catching bright colors does not mean that they are concerned with color in a way that the darker paintings are not. Both types of painting use color as an expressive means to an end, but as a means only. And it is the form, proportion, and space that set the parameters for that expression. They define the topic which color may then expound on. Go to the next slide. There was just one further evolutionary step that Rothko took in the formal development of his paintings. This step is embodied in the series of black and gray canvases and brown and gray works on paper that are amongst his, his last works. The changes here are not ones of color. Rothko had used black, brown, and gray extensively before, although admittedly in the context of other colors. No, the changes here are formal, even as Rothko continued to cling to the rectangle. But the rectangle's orientation to space has been significantly changed. There is no longer any background. The rectangles do not float in any space, and the bipartite forms meet, meet abruptly at a horizon line, 
with no intervening background or color to serve as an intermediary between them. The juxtaposition, the juxtaposition is intense and absolute, and it shapes our view of the painting as much as the striking palette. But Rothko giveth, even while he taketh away, for while there is no background color to provide an order between the rectangles or around the rectangles, he has imposed a new one in the form of a thin white boundary around each edge. My father's paintings have been frameless since the mid 1940s, yet here in 1969, at the twilight of his career, he imposes what amounts to a white frame around each work. Of course, in a sense, my father's classic paintings had always been framed by the colorful background that surrounded each rectangle, and that frame sculpted our viewpoint into the work. The white border in the late works was different, however, or existed in the same plane as the rectangles themselves, or perhaps giving the illusion of a physical frame that appears just in front of the rectangles. By so doing, it no longer allows the rectangles to expand and float free. They are, out, they are resolutely boxed in, their energy contained. These formal changes are subtle, but they completely change the viewer's experience of the painting. They focus our perspective definitively onto the plane before us, drawing us sharply inward from the vistas opened up by Rothko's earlier classic work. It's as if Rothko is saying, this is all there is. The answer is inward, not in the beyond. And, and it's, it's not, not the color that tells us this. It's, it's my father's redefinition of the painting space by manipulation of its borders that, that orients us to this new perspective. Now, now any, any of you who've heard me lecture about my father's work before knows that there is a point where I shift the focus from the classic works of the 50s and 60s to his earlier work and say, and it was ever so. This case is no different. Spatial and formal preoccupations dominated my father's painting from the very beginnings of his career and set the stage for the close study of proportion in his work. Nearly 20 years as a figurative painter honed Rothko's awareness of the role space and form in it played in his work, be it landscape, nude, portrait, or urban scene. You can see an example of one of those urban scenes in this tiny little painting from around 1939. Perhaps not most notable are my father's depiction of interior spaces where formal considerations already dominate. In a precursor of rectangles to come, windows and door frames populate the landscape of Rothko's interiors in numbers disproportionate to the natural frequency. If we look at the next slide, we can see two more examples where our figures seem to disappear into a series of almost geometric frames, the window frame and curtains around the boy on the left, and this man, sometimes known as the architect, who appeared, who disappears in a series of door frames on the right, and his, uh, it's hard to almost distinguish it from the table in front of him. The spaces in these works seem to be the primary focus, while the figures are nearly swallowed by the architectural details surrounding them. And while the color in these paintings can be striking, certainly so in the case of the boy, it is really the framing of the scenes that defines the role of the figures in it and our perspective on those figures. We move to the next slide. <clears throat> the form and space are again the defining elements in this little known sub subway scene from 1939. And once more, we have figures that nearly disappear, this time into each other. And it is the space that they inhabit that grabs our attention. The entryway they are walking down into is painted so uniformly in color that it's hard to tell what kind of incline they are standing on. Meanwhile, the shape of this essentially three-sided box is distorted, so it's hard to determine the actual size of the figures and the relationship to the pit space. And one can, while one can intuit the movement downward because they are standing on stairs, the figures, in fact, appear static and almost disengaged from the plane. Although, although I think my father's use of color in this painting is brilliant in its subtlety, clearly it is the form and space that dictate our relationship. To the work. By the same token, it is the space that speaks to us, the relationship of Rothko's characters to the world around them. Moving forward in time in the next slide, Rothko evolved from a purely figurative painter into a neo-surrealist style 
around 1940. To some degree, both form and color take a backseat to the myth driven agendas of these works. But also, it is the form that primarily shapes his rendering of the myths. This is in part because the mythic figures are so central to the meaning of the painting, as is the case of Tiresias here, who nearly walks out of the painting, such as his, or is it her, forward motion. Yet we should also note the bipartite and tripart division of the scene that marks the majority of works from this period, as we can see in the next slide, an untitled work from 1945. The rectangle already acts as a framing background for these scenes. And while I emphatically do not believe that it's simply a matter of stripping away the figures to get to Rothko's classic work of a few years hence, we should note that even at this point, the rectangle is there shaping the space. So you want color? Well, with the multi-forms starting in 1946, you certainly get color. If we move to the next slide, we see a very nice example, number 32, from, uh, I'm sorry, uh, an untitled work from 1948. Here Rothko discovers uh, as a primary expressive medium. I'm sorry, here Rothko discovers color as a primary expressive medium. You can feel the freedom as he courts a type of formlessness and unbound all over painting. And not coincidentally, it's at this point in his career that he abandons the frame. Color here is, to, is clearly dominant and giving, giving free reign a free man that it has not experienced before, and it will not experience again. And yet, if one observes a sequence of these works, it is not so much questions of color or color expressivity or color relationships that Rob is working out, but you guessed it, questions of form. How, how large and uniform to make the color patches, how to give them weight and balance different areas of the canvas. These are the formal questions he continues to ask, and the answer he gives leads directly to the classic work. And one can witness the direction of his experimentation in this area by examining the sequence of works from this period with their gradual tautening of form and composition, as we will see momentarily. Then we come nearly full circle and are back on the brink of Rothko's arrival at his classic style. There remains only the year of transitional paintings, 1948 into 1949, that bridge the multiforms to the classic sexuals. These roughly 40 paintings, however, tell us perhaps more about Rothko's use of form than any others of his career. Well, 1949 was the year of slow but steady movement to the rectangle. We can observe that journey step by step, starting with this 1948 multiform we just examined. If we move to the next slide, we can see it in juxtaposition with number 203 of 1954. And we can see that in the 1958 work, I'm sorry, the 1948 work, the color is already there. But, and although Rothko will simplify a little, this painting really has the full expressive color palette of the 1954 work on its right. But what changes as we creep forward in time is the tightening and the tightening of form, the creation of a context in which the color can speak more directly. Move to the next slide. A title 1948 shows the first stage of my father focusing on form and edging toward the rectangle. The process continues through three magnificent transitional examples. First, the next slide, another untitled work from 1948, where we see things coalescing into a little more of what we expect from a Rothko. And then to number 20, 1949. Until by the next slide, Number 11, 1949, and by the way, you should take neither the uh, numbers nor the dates very seriously. These are all from about the same period. In fact, we can intuit the, the progress, which is what uh, the progression, which is what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm actually uh, disagreeing with the, the author catalog resume by doing them in this sequence. I'm not sure that he would actually disagree with me. <laughs> but in any case, by this work, we have really a fully rectangle based composition. And it's only a question of arrangement and balance that takes place for us to reach will be recognized as a classic Rothko. <clears throat> and in truth, as we look in the next, and see in the next slide, Rothko continued to experiment with form and the shape of his rectangles throughout the early 1950s. But this is the difference between number 14, 1951 on the left 
and number two, 203, 1954, I'm on the right. Both classic Grothgos, but each with a very different idea of what a rectangle is and how it functions in the space. Okay, so the next slide. The formal development during this year long period of 1949 is strikingly concentrated. It makes clear how central form is, is to the expressive power of Rothko's paintings. His bold use of color was already there in the multi forms. But the breakthrough of 1949 is one of form. By simplifying to the full frame rectangle, Rothko found a style in which form could serve the color absolutely by creating context and defining its parameters. Great as the, entry, as the transitional paintings are, and I do dearly love this work from 1948 on the left, they still do not speak to us quite as clearly as the classic works, such as this very early classic work from 1950 on the right. Only there does the form work symbiotically with color to allow the paintings to sing with full voice and clean diction. To shift the metaphor just slightly, we can think of the rectangle and its balance and space as the essential grammar and syntax of a Rothko painting that allows the rich vocabulary of color to express itself with meaning. Perhaps ultimately, my father did not choose the rectangle. It was simply there, the most essential element in the spatial world he was exploring. It came to define the universe in which he worked, but it was a universe of near infinite possibilities. He molded and sculpted and even played with the form until it was no longer a limiting factor, but a liberating one, whose horizons were bounded only by his and the viewer's imaginations. And yes, he brought color to tint that universe as well. Thank you very much. And I will uh, welcome Michael uh, back into the chat here. He is going to uh, take some of your questions and uh, feed them to me, and I'll uh, answer uh, as many as we have time for. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. That was um, a really fascinating lecture. And, uh, and until the questions start pouring in, I'm, I'm just going to start you off um, with two formulated questions. So your father is a, a well-educated person, a, attended Yale and was possibly aware of uh, classical and Renaissance painting conventions. Was he aware of and in any way influenced by the formal ratio known as the golden section or the golden rectangle in his classic style in the 50s before his works evolved into that more square format uh, in the 60s? Um, you, you are not alone in wondering that. Uh, I have talked with many scholars. Unfortunately, there's no, there's, there's simply no evidence. We don't, uh, he does not note it in any of his writings or any, we don't have any notes about it. Uh, we don't have any books that would indicate that he was reading about it. But yes, you, you are right. He uh, was a well-educated man. And even though he never studied formally art history, he was very much a student of art history. And my, my sense is he, he must have been aware. I don't know how consciously he brought that to his own work. I don't know if he sort of uh, bought in, if you will, to the sort of mystical uh, aspects of those proportions. Uh, but it, I would be surprised if he, if he had sort of not encountered that concept. Okay, and then a related question, uh, you know, as he moved uh, in, into the 60s into that more square format, and you noted the relationship between uh, the buildings or the intended spaces as becoming more and more important to, to him, uh, was he also in going to that square format consciously avoiding a vertical rectangular format that, you know, suggested a portrait or a horizontal format that is, you know, suggested a landscape? Was that one of the the impulses yes and uh, yeah, certainly portrait and landscape have discussed been discussed in my father's work a lot and, and it's ironic because even in the 50s early 50s works where they tend to be more vertical still the rectangles are typically horizontal so you have landscape within a portrait but what, what i note about I, i'm reluctant to call the earlier works portraits even though i sort of i, I mean so the 50s works portraits even though i did sort of do that with one painting here um but many, many, many of those works, sort of like the, the most typical size for a Rothko 50s painting is about six feet tall. And he was about six feet tall. 
So my sense is that he is essentially, whether you want to think of it as a mirror, or whether you want to just think of it as him painting human-sized paintings, but I don't think that's an accident. Um, I, I do think that he's creating a painting that you can really stare, uh, stare at face to face. And then as he moves to these uh, uh, increasingly involved with commissions, uh, groups of works, large spaces, he is really filling our vistas. And he's also changing the pace at which you're interacting uh, with his, his work. So he's, rea he's reacting to a, a different change of uh, pace because you're going to be in a room, presumably for a longer period of time. Thank you. And so related to this, uh, we have a question uh, about you know the fact that museum walls, with the exception, let's say, of, of the Guggenheim Museum, are rectangles, and you know we also are used to viewing images on computer screens. And and how does this affect the experience now? Do you believe of of viewing uh, your father's work? You know, certainly, again, you know, picture frames, they're also square, you know, paintings are typically square, this is, this is not an accident, again, I think it's back to that uh, sort of box of vision that we have, but, but the question about museum walls is one that I'm dealing with constantly, because despite the fact that many Rothko paintings are quite large, there are, you know, a uh, few that are well over 10 feet tall, um, so many particularly contemporary art galleries have walls that are 20 feet, even 30 feet tall to accommodate huge installation pieces, uh, and, and subsequent works that uh, really, uh, you know, take over the space. And the, the Rothko paintings can look like poster stamps on those walls, which is funny. These works that he created to be sort of so all-encompassing in, in some ways can look quite small. So I've, I've gotten, I, I'm often quite involved with hanging of, of uh, Rothko's, uh, Rothko installations. And we will often uh, either, um, if, if the ceiling can be dropped, we do. We put screens down. We will not light the top you know, 10 or 15 feet of the wall. There are many tricks, but we often try to make you believe that the wall is less tall than it is because it absolutely affects your perception of the space and your perception of, of the Rothko painting within that space. And since he's so involved with questions in space, you know, the, the, the room in which you see it is critical in the painting. You see a Rothko retrospective in one uh, museum, you follow it to the second museum it goes to, it can look like a different exhibition precisely for, for those spatial and lighting reasons. Well, it's interesting. Thank you for that question um, uh, from our audience. And you, you touched on something which I, I know was, was not only important to Rothko, but often very frustrating, which is the issue of lighting. And I wonder if you could just touch briefly on, uh, you know, the importance of lighting with, with his works and what he thought of as sort of the ideal lighting in terms of strength and source and warmth, tone. So uh, fortunately, we actually do have this documented uh, when his show, his uh, 1961 show at MoMA traveled to, um, traveled to uh, London. Uh, he uh, initially was not going to go. He actually, in the end, did end up going, but he had a series of just wonderful, uh, wonderful exchanges by letter with um, uh, David Robertson, the, uh, the curator there. And, um, uh, and he documents, in fact, precisely how he wants the paintings hung. He wants them hung low, so again, you can sort of look at them uh, and they can look at you directly, but he also wants the lights very low. And my favorite story about this is that the first Rothko room anywhere was at the Phillips Collection in Washington, which is still, still there. Uh, it's a new building, but the proportions are exactly the same. Uh, but every time he went to Washington, which is a fair bit because he had a very, uh, nephew he was very fond of who uh, lived in Washington, um, he would go to the Phillips room and we'd go to turn down the lights. And every time he went, he would go and turn down the lights. And apparently also at the moment 61 show, uh, where he lived just, uh, just a couple blocks away, he would go and go into the galleries and turn down the lights. And I, I, I know this is a battle that exists today um, that, that you now, you now fight. Um, turning to something that, that is a, a little more esoteric, we have an interesting question from the audience uh, about what, your father might have been reading uh, concurrent with his painting. And is there any record uh, or suggesting that, um, you know, he was inspired by any kind of uh, intellectual movement or, uh, you know, that was then current or whether the painting was, was largely intuitive? Um, so we don't, we don't have a great deal of evidence. He does, uh, he, we know that he was reading a lot of Shakespeare. We know he references Shakespeare in his writings. Uh, he talks uh, in actually, he, the only time he talks about um, writers in his later writings, of which there's not very much, he really sort of shut up and 
decided just to paint and not talk about his painting. But he talks about, about uh, both uh, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. And uh, Nietzsche's birth of tragedy was really formative to him, both um, earlier in his career when he was thinking about drama. Remember I talked to him talk about paintings as dramas. He's very much thinking about Greek tra tragedy and Nietzsche's view into Greek tragedy uh, in his own uh, creating of a sense of drama in his paintings. Uh, and he also, he references um, in a 1957 um, lecture, he uh, references uh, uh, Peter and Gemley, uh, Kierkegaard's uh, famous essay. So, um, but other than that, we know that he wrote a fair bit of poetry, he had a number of poet friends, um, but we don't, we don't really have a great deal of evidence. Um, he spent a lot of time in the studio and I, when he was home, he was actually very much a family man. So much of the reading that went on was in the studio and that was sort of his private space. Thank you. Uh, you know, much as we would love to, to keep you here forever, I, th I think we probably have time for one more question, if you'll allow it, um, from the audience. And, and this relates to this exciting new restoration of the Rothko Chapel. And I hope for any of you out there that you will look at the picture and prose event uh, coming up in, in the museum later this spring, early summer, and Christopher Rothko coming back. Um, but the question is, how did the Rothko Chapel solve the issue of walls and placement uh, and meaning that, that you discussed? Sum it up in one sentence. How did, how did it solve it? For like, <laughs> actually, you have only the written question. I don't, I don't know if, that, if you're asking how we solved the, uh, the issue of some of the questions about that or whether how he, he solved those or how playing, working through the chapel commission actually was a way that he thought, thought about those. Um, I, I will say that actually, even when I wrote this lecture, I did not fully appreciate the Rothko Chapel's place in his career. I thought that it was almost an exception. And now I've come to realize it's actually the very culmination. It's like the, most, the purest example of what he was trying to do. He was uh, trying to have, uh, give the viewer an interaction with paintings that was, um, uh, that could occur over time, that didn't need to be just a moment in the museum, that was um, uh, meditative, that was deeply personal, and where the viewer is actively, actively engaged in creating that meaning. And if you go to the Rothko Chapel, and if you haven't been to the Rothko Chapel, I'd really urge you to go because now that it's reopened, uh, restored, it is so much better than it ever was before. Um, but um, if you go to the Rothko Chapel, you will find that those paintings they, they give you the suggestion of what you need to do, which is that you need to make sense of this place, and you can only do that in a very personal way. But they don't really give you a lot of clues. They, you have to meet them more than halfway, and to really make sense of that place and to really get out of, a lot out of it, uh, you have a lot of work to do. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite demanding, and it was really, I think, a pretty uh, bold move on his part. But I think it's really what he wanted to be doing all, all, all along. And I think it's part of the reason he, he toned down his color palette uh, starting in the late 50s, because he didn't want to give people the impression that it's just about this direct engagement with sensuality. That was a hook. And he really wanted to get you into a conversation. And over time, he decided to make that hook less intense. He was going to lose some people, but the people who stopped were going to stop for a longer period of time and really try to make sense of, of what he had done. And, and, and also what's going on in their in their own in their own worlds, which is also where he wants you to go. That's a, a wonderful uh, place to to finish up with sort of an encapsulation of of uh, what what he wanted to do with his work. And again, I do hope that that people will uh, come back for a more full discussion of the Rothko Chapel uh, and it, its renovation later. Uh, this season. So thank you so much again, Christopher, for spending the evening with us. Uh, thanks again to uh, the Rosenberg family and to the Zinmans for their uh, generous uh, contributions, allowing the Rothko Room and uh, to the KMA staff and especially to Michelle Rakowski and Emily Hanlon for organizing this, uh, this uh, evening. Good night.